September 1910, prior to opening her course for canonization. During her last illness, Sister Therese of the Child Jesus had often asserted her desire that after her death, nothing of her would be found if her body was exhumed, save her bones. You have loved God too much for that to happen, said the novice to her shortly before her death. He will work a miracle for you, and we shall find your body incorrupt. Oh no, answered Therese. That miracle would be to stray away from my little path of humility, and little souls must not find anything in me to be envied. On September 6, 1910, the remains of St. Therese were exhumed to make sure of their being preserved, but without any intention of exposing them to the veneration of the faithful. Efforts had been made to keep the matter secret, but in spite of the precaution, it became known and hundreds made their way to the cemetery. The work of taking up the remains presented great difficulties, as the coffin lay at a depth of over 11 feet and was in a very bad state of decay. The operation were directed by an expert in this kind of work. He had bored sleep under the coffin, the bottom of which threatened to give way. Both coffin and boards were surrounded with strong canvas and lashes together with stout leather straps. After much delay and anxiety, the man succeeded in bringing up the coffin without any mishap. When it came to sight, the bishop intoned David Cantico in praise of the Lord, who raises up the lowly from the dust, that he may bless him with, with the prince of his people. Through the loose board was seen, fresh and green as ever, the palm which had been laid upon the remains of Therese on October 4, 1897. Perhaps a symbol of the immortal palm she had worn by her martyrdom of self that martyrdom of which she had written. I desire at all costs to win the poem of Agnes, if not by the shedding of blood, then by love. The coffin was then opened. Two workmen, a father and a son, one of them the carpenter who had made it, were standing close by as this was done, and they noticed a strong scent of violets for which there was no natural explanation, and it made a deep impression upon them. At first her garments appeared to have been preserved, but on closer inspection, it was seen that both the veil and the wimple had completely disintegrated. Moreover, the cork's thick material of the Kamalai dress had become quite flimsy and could easily be torn. Finally, as the humble nun has desired, Nothing was found of her except her bones. One of the doctors wished to present Monsignor Le Monnier with a 
fragment of the letter, but he forbid any of the remains to be taken away, and would accept only the little cost that had been placed in the hands of Therese. The old coffin was then laid in a shell of lead, and this within another of oak. A new rope was placed on the sacred remains, while the skull was covered with a veil and surrounded with roses. These had been gathered from the very rose trees whose blooms the saintly Therese had so often cast at the foot of the cross on the convent grounds. Afterwards, the coffin was placed upon a trestle in front of the entrance of the graveyard. For 45 minutes, there was a constant succession of people bringing pious objects to touch to the sacred remains. The Bishop of Bayer had been the first to touch a cloth on her bone. It is estimated that over 500 people paid their respect after having waited three hours. The hearts of those present felt an increase of fervor and devotion. The up coffin was then sealed shut and placed in a new grave which had been dug a short distance from the first and lined with bricks. That evening, the words from the first coffin, along with a few bits of the clothing and the palm, were all taken to the convent. The sister who had been sent to gather them together was on two distinct occasions favor with the scents of roses. At other times, pieces of clothing and of the coffin emitted a fragrance of incense. On September 5, the day before the exhumation, St. Therese made a miraculous appearance to the mother prioress of the Carmel of Gallipoli in Italy and told her that the next day nothing would be found of her remain except her bones. Why she made her pharmacy at the same time something of the wonders she would afterward perform. Her blessed remains will work great miracles and will be as mighty weapons against Satan. A few weeks later, a certain university professor heard of the result of the, of the disinterment. A man of great intellect and sanctity, he had received all manner of graces from St. Therese since he came to know of her more than ten years before. He was grieved at first that the saint had been made subject to the law of nature, and as he dwelt upon these gloomy thoughts, he heard a voice within him say, It was the rope of my working day I let aside. I await the rope of the eternal Sunday. I am little concerned as to what happened to the other. And then added the professor, an interior light consoled me, and I understood that by means of this dissolution, the very atom of her body would be scattered throughout the world. And I understood that by means of this dissolution, the very atom of her body would be scattered throughout the world, so that not only her soul but also her body might be present and do good upon the earth. Indeed, it seems to me that everything which has really belonged to the body of 
a sign is sacred. And if this be so, not only the bones, but also the invisible molecules of matter may process and carry afar the grace that accompanies relics. On August 14, 1921, Pope Benedict 15 declared that Therese had lived a life of heroic virtue, the declaration which gave her the title Venerable. After Pope Benedict died early in 1922, Pope Pius XI continued her course, Beatification of St. Therese. In 1923, the Church approved of two spontaneous cures unexplained by medical treatment. After praying to St. Therese, Sister Louise of St. German was cure of the stomach ulcers she suffered with from 1913 to 1916. During the night of September 10, 1916, St. Therese appeared to Sister Louise and said, You will recover soon. I promise you. However, in the morning, Several nuns found those beetles of all colors strewn around the bed of the patient. A few days later, on September 22, Sister awoke fully healed. Supporting the treatment doctor's certificate are a conclusive x-ray and two reports on from the eminent Dr. Beck, a surgeon at St. Joseph Hospital in Paris, and another one from Dr. Victor Poche, a highly recognized doctor, confirming the supernatural nature of this sudden and sustainable transformation. The second cure involved Jacques Anne, a 23-year-old seminarian who was dying from advanced pulmonary tuberculosis. The night he thought he was dying, Jacques prayed to Therese. Afterward, the examining doctor testified. The destroyed and ravaged lungs have been replaced by new lungs carrying out their normal function and about to revise the entire organism. A slight emaciation persists which will disappear within a few days under a regularly assimilated diet. The cures having been declared miraculous, on April 29, 1923, she was beatified by Pope Pius XI in St. Peter's Basilica, which declared her Blessed Therese of Lisieux. The Canonization of St. Therese the outpouring from all over the world again spurred Pope Pius XI to dispense with canon laws time frames. Once she was declared blessed, it took only two years for the next two miracles to be approved. In 1925, Two cures had been investigated and judged to be supernatural through the intersection of St. Therese. The first involved Sister Gabrielle Trimusi from Parma, 
Italy. Sister Gabriel, who at the age of 23 had entered the convent of the poor daughters of the Sacred Heart in Parma, Italy, began in 1913 to suffer from pain in her left knee. She was in the habit of breaking the five words across her knee, and this go a lesson at the joint which prepared the way for the tuberculosis infection. The trouble began with a new pain, then the knee became swollen, and finally loss of appetite brought about emaciation. She was attended by two physicians without success, so that three years later she was sent to Milan, where injections, sun bath, and various other forms of treatment were tried in vain. At the end of four years, the spine itself became affected. The invalid returned to Papma, where several doctors diagnosed it is a case of tuberculosis lesion and prescribed general remedies. A radiograph of the knee revealed at this period the existence of periostitis at the head of the tibia. Taken to the hospital, she was once more subject to x-rays, but why there was attacks by Spanish influenza and began to suffer fresh and constantly increasing pain in the vertebral column. All remedies proving ineffective, she was recommended by a priest on June 13, 1923 to join in a public novena in honor of Blessed Therese. She joined in the prayers. More concerned over the health of the other nuns than her own, the close of the novena coincided with the close of a triadum in a neighboring Camel and several of the nuns, Graviala among the rest, sought permission to attend the ceremony. On her return, after slowly and painfully affecting the short journey, she entered the chapel of the community where the others were already assembled, exhorted her to pray with confidence and bid her to go to her place. Strange to say, the invalid knelt down unconsciously on her knee without feeling the slightest pain, nor did she realize what she had done on account of the increase of suffering at the moment in the spine. She next went to the refectory with the others, and the meal finished, slowly mounted the stairs, going into the first room that she saw, she took up the apparatus she wore to support the spine and cried out loudly, I am cured, I am cured. Sister Gabriela Trimusi returned at once to her labors and the uh, exercise of religious life without either pain or fatigue. The doctors appointed by sacred congregation discuss the miracle at great length and decide that the lesion at the knee was chronic arthrosinovitis and the spine trouble was chronic spondylitis. These two lesions, rebellious to all other treatment, yield to the God's power 
and Sister Graviella, by a miracle, recover her health permanently. The final cure involved Maria Bellerman of the Czech Bank, Belgium, in October, in October 1919. Maria Bellman was a victim of pulmonary tuberculosis, which had spread a sterile illness head to her intestines. intestines. This was followed by gastritis and enteritis, both of them likewise of a tuberculous nature. She was medically attended at home, then in a sanatorium. In August 1920, she went to Lourdes, but all to no purpose. In March 1923, she accompanied a small band of pilgrims to leisure, and while kneeling at the tomb of the Blessed Therese, she was suddenly restored to perfect health. The original diagnosis of pulmonary and intestinal tuberculosis was made by Dr. Van Den Steen, who also examined Maria after she came back from visiting Therese's grave. The doctor testified, I found Miss Bellerman literally transformed. This young woman, previously out of breath from the least movement, now moves about without fatigue. She eats everything given to her with a very good appetite. The abdomen presents no lender point when formerly the least pressure produced severe pain. All symptoms of tubercular ulceration of the intestine have disappeared. In reports predating Maria return to health, two other physicians confirm Dr. Van Den Steen's diagnosis of pulmonary and intestinal tuberculosis. On May 17, 1925, just over two years after her beatification, Therese was officially declared a saint by Pope Pius XI, while her four sister nuns were still living. The saints in St. Peter's were said to be almost impossible to describe. The gathering was the largest and most distinguished for centuries. Thirty-four cardinals were present, and over 200 bishops and innumerable representatives from religious orders and missionary society. Bishop Michael James Gallagher, Bishop of Detroit, who was present at the canonization road. I never witnessed such a magnificent spectacle as when the Holy Father, surrounded by hundreds of bishops and dignitaries, hundreds of guards in brilliant medieval uniform, and a vast concourse of 80,000 people solemnly declared the humble nun a saint of God. The scene at the consecration of the Mass was sublime beyond description. In Jerusalem of all, at the sound of the trumpet, 100,000 Israelites in the streets or on the roof of their houses, all turned toward the temple and fell on their knees. That scene was dwarfed 
by the grand spectacle in St. Peter's. Thousands of soldiers who stood till then fell on their knees on the hearse came over the vast throng, and then Christ descended on the altar, which became another Bethlehem of why high up in the dome a trumpet sounded and the thousand outside joined with those in the basilica in an act of adoration. No court in the world could ever evoke such splendor and enthusiasm. In the bull of canonization of St. Therese, Pope Pius XI wrote, This virgin, truly wise and prudent, walk in the way of the Lord in the simplicity of her soul and being made perfect in a short space, filled a long time. Thereafter, while still in the flower of her years, she was called to paradise to receive the crown, which her heavenly spouse had prepared for her. During her lifetime, she was known only to a few, but immediately after her saintly death, her fame spread abroad in marvelous fashion throughout the whole Christian world on account of the innumerable wonders wrought by Almighty God at her intercession. Indeed, it seems as if in accordance with her dying promise, she were letting fall upon earth a shower of roses. Hence, it came to pass that Holy Church decided to bestow upon her high reserve for the saint without observing the, the statutory delays. The parents of Saint Therese Louis Martin and Mary Azeli Gering. Louis Martin was born into a military family in Bordeaux, France. On August 22, 1823, and spent his early years at various French military posts. At the end of his studies, he didn't turn toward a military career like his father but chose to study watchmaking. However, in 1845, at the age of 22, being a man of faith and prayer, Louis went to the sweet arms in hopes of entering a Carthusian monastery. However, he was told he couldn't enter until he learned Latin. Disappointed, Louis went to Alençon to study Latin, but was unable to grasp it. In this journal, he wrote, I have saw my French Latin dictionary. He just gave up. Whatever the full story, basically he realized that he did not have a vocation to the priesthood, he returned to watchmaking, dedicating himself to his work. And Mary Azeli, Zeli Gering, was also born into a military family at Grand Delaine, France, on December 23, 1831. When her father retired in 1844, the family moved to Alonso. Zeli studied under the sister of perpetual adoration and received training as a lace maker. She met the famous point Alonso and was eventually in charge of sales for her own lace making business. Like her sister, Mary Louise Gering who was a nun at a visitation convent in Le Mans, Zeli wanted to consecrate herself to the Lord as a nun. 
she met with the superior of the daughter of charity of Saint Vincent de Paul, but was turned away due to respiratory difficulties and recurrent headaches. A providential meeting united these two young people thirsty for the absolute. One day, as Zeli crossed the St. Leonard Bridge, she passed a young man with a noble face, a reserved air, and a demeanor filled with an impressive dignity. At that moment, an interior voice whispered, This is he whom I have prepared for you. The identity of the passerby was soon revealed to be Louis Martin. Louis and Zelie quickly came to appreciate and love each other. Their spiritual harmony established itself so quickly that a religious engagement sealed their mutual commitment within three months. They did not see their upcoming marriage as a normal arrangement between the two middle-class families of Alonso, but as a total opening to the will of God. From the beginning, the betrothed couple placed their love under the protection of God, who, in their union, would always be the first served. Their marriage was celebrated at midnight on July 13, 1858, in Notre Dame de Langson, when Louis was 35 and Zélie 27. Compared to Zélie, a tender but undeniably domineering woman, Louis Martin seems to have been made of much softer stuff. He was a dreamer and a brooder, an idealist and a romantic. He loved nature with a deep sentimental enthusiasm. He also had wondrous making pilgrimages to Chartres and Lourdes, to Germany and Austria, to Rome, and even to Constantinople, and planned but did not leave to carry out a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Along with his design for adventure was an impulse towards withdrawal. In Lycia, he arranged a little den for himself, hind up in the attic for praying, reading. Even his daughters were not allowed to enter it unless they wished spiritual conversation and self-examination. As in a monastery, he divided day into worship, garden work, and relaxation. Louis and Jelly decided at the beginning of their marriage to maintain perfect chastity. However, divine wisdom had other views for this couple, and at the end of the first ten months, on the advice of a priest friend, they decided to have many children in order to raise them and offer them to the Lord.